Katie Sawyer is a licensed civil engineer with a background in transportation and municipal engineering. She specializes in the design, construction, and maintenance of active transportation and traffic safety projects. Katie is a member of the National Committee of Uniform Traffic Control Devices, where she helps to advance the adoption of complete streets principles in the transportation profession. When she isn't working in the right of way, Katie may be found backpacking in Appalachia with her family. Paige Anderson is a project manager on the City of Pittsburgh Department of Mobility and Infrastructure's traffic engineering team, where she's worked since 2017. In that time, they've introduced traffic calming to the city of Pittsburgh and built over 30 miles of bike infrastructure throughout their city, known for big potholes and bigger hills. A self-described plan engineer, she focuses on data-informed design and network planning. When she's not thinking about or biking about Pittsburgh streets, she enjoys making pottery and bike camping. I'm with Tool Design in our Pittsburgh office. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Tool Design. Uh, we are planners, landscape architects, engineers focused on active transportation. Um, we use Streetlight with clients across the country, um, just so kind of people are aware of how it usually works. We don't have a Streetlight subscription. We use our client subscriptions. Um, and we, um, if the client has an existing subscription, we happily use it. If they don't have a subscription, um, we tend to look towards their state agency to see if there's a data sharing agreement they can jump on. Um, we also help our clients um, determine which of the many platforms are the best ones to use um, for their particular purpose. And during that sort of proposal writing process, we'll help connect them to something like Streetlight. We did that recently for an origin destination study. Um, and we can even help them find the right package. Maybe there's some other things you want to investigate while you have that package if you're not going to have an ongoing subscription. Um, so that's typically how we work in the streetlight realm. Um, in the case of Pittsburgh, they had an active um, subscription, and so we were able to very quickly pull some data that was very helpful um, for a very unique situation, which was the Fern Hollow Bridge collapse. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Paige to talk a little bit more about the project. Thanks, Katie. Um, so yeah, I hope this isn't like a common use case that anyone else can relate to, but in uh, 2022, when we came into work that day, we had heard that early in the morning, it was late January, there a bridge had collapsed. Um, it looks in these photos to be um, like a rural area, but it's actually the middle of a very popular park in a dense urban neighborhood. Um, so it was quite shocking. Um, luckily, it was early in very early in the morning, and there were very few people. Um, one very unlucky bus, um, but very few people there, and luckily, no one was killed or, or seriously injured, um, which is great news for us because Pittsburgh loves to make um, light of a situation. If you can go to the next slide, so Pittsburgh, we have we're quite resilient city. We have some transportation woes, and you know we try to take it with a smile, and then move quickly into redesign, rebuilding this bridge. Um, luckily, uh, PennDOT swooped in and they were able to expedite the emergency funding process to get this bridge built back as quickly as possible. Um, uh, we actually succeeded and they were able to get the new build, bridge up and running um, within before the before 2023 it was right before christmas so it's a, a big effort and um pretty amazing that they were able to do that one change in working with the city one big change that we wanted to see was that um it had some very the previous bridge had some very narrow sidewalks um but no and no bike infrastructure on the bridge so in redesigning the bridge we worked with them to get a wider as wide as we could shared use path on um on one of the sides uh, because it is in this park and there's a lot of recreational uh, walkers and bikers as well as commuters that rely on Forbes Ave. So um, that was the big change that that we got them to incorporate. Um, but it meant that we had to very quickly react to to the changes to the network um, that came that came from this. So the previous condition had had um, Forbes Ave had had bike lanes on it. Although if you look at this photo, it's pretty easy to see that they're not the most welcoming bike lanes. You can barely see them on the end. They're just buffered bike lanes um, on a four lane highway with 35 mile per hour um, speeds and over 20,000 vehicles um, per day. So definitely not something that 
uh, bike lanes that we would install today, especially because if you look at uh, this image, you can see that they don't actually go all the way to the bridge or all the way to the next intersection. And so you have to get to and from the bike lanes, very low use, very unsafe. So uh, with these change, we are looking to make our update to uh, two-way protected cycle track. It's our first ever Jersey barrier protected cycle track in the city of Pittsburgh. We also lowered the speed limit to 25 miles per hour um, through the park on Forbes Ave. So it's very exciting. Um, but what it led us to is this intersection to the west of Forbes Ave that is quite atypical. Um, it'd been on our radar for a long time. We actually had already started working with another consultant on what we are calling a complex intersection analysis to start to get a, a bearing of what's going on um, on this, this wild corridors. Um, but what they had been scheduled to collect data um, I think in March 2022. So this bridge collapse, um, you know, we were we were excited that with the pandemic, we were finally ready to collect data. And it was very poor timing for this um, because we weren't able to collect that data with the bridge collapse. So that's when we turned to Streetlight um, to better understand how this intersection works, um, especially now that we were going to not only be looking to upgrade it um, for safety, but also adding this new complexity of um, different bike configurations. Uh, what we understood from the streetlight data is that the dominant movement is this squiggle from Beacon to Dallas through Beachwood and Forbes. Um, if you can see Dallas between Forbes and Beachwood is really, really small queue lengths. And so that backup would sometimes create issues with the other corridors. Um, and then all the way on the right, there was actually this little slip lane. Um, well, I don't know what to call it, but we've been calling it a slip lane, even though it's not quite quite the right word, but um, it was kind of acting as a relief valve. So when that queue got too long, people would go over to this little cut through. And with the streetlight data, we actually realized that they were not only turning right, but they were sometimes going all the way around the queue, doing weird maneuvers and then turning left onto Forbes. So it kind of helped us understand where some of this crash history was coming from and some of the, the major movements that we were moving through here. Yeah, and so <clears throat> I can, jump okay. in here. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the city was really looking at connecting that two-way cycle track, closing that slip ramp, that relief valve to the intersection, and connecting that two-way cycle track to that existing bike lane. Um, one of the concerns there, closing that slip ramp where you were getting a lot of um, right turn movements, um, those movements from Beachwood Boulevard would be moved down um, to that signalized intersection. Um, and so understanding sort of the right hook conflicts that could happen there, the new introduced um, traffic, trying to use that intersection. Um, so by using that streetlight data, we were able to better understand who was using that slip ramp and how um, without actually having to go out and do actual traffic counts because, because of the bridge closure, there was no traffic on Forbes, nobody was using the slip ramp. Um, so we were able to go back in time and really understand more of what was going on there. The alternatives that we looked at were um, closing that small leg of Dallas and actually making all of traffic on Beachwood go to the left to um, the Forbes and Beachwood signalized intersection. Um, because this was a very quick build project, um, we knew that that change would require left turn lanes, removing parking, um, wasn't really on the table. And the city ultimately decided to make that little leg um, for now of South Dallas um, southbound only, um, eliminating that right turn conflict because no one's turning on to Beachwood, um, northbound Beacon Street would redirect um, to Beachwood Boulevard, but southbound Dallas could still come through the intersection. Um, so really, it was kind of interesting. Um, I would also add for the streetlight data, I think I forgot to, um, to touch on this, but we did have to do a little bit of um, tweaking to the streetlight data. I think everyone that uses it historically um, will, will find they need to make some adjustments. So we uh, modified the volumes by rounding up to five, um, and then we balanced to account for the vehicles in the network. Um, the city provided us with 2019 signal timings. Um, an interesting thing is that with our volumes, the 2019 balanced volumes, the signal timing wasn't really working, which the intersection wasn't working. The city probably never optimized or you know, used synchro to, to optimize the, um, the traffic signals. They were probably just making adjustments in the field. Um, so we did first optimize that 2019 baseline so that we kind of had apples to apples. Um, and then we also just 
made sure that the volume to capacity ratio was adjusted to be under one. Um, but once we did that, we found that it was very helpful to be able to use some of that 2019 data um, to really understand what the impacts of, um, of all these operational changes would be and to be able to weigh um, you know, the trade-offs between all users. Um, and I think that is everything. Um, so this was installed in um, August of this year. So the bridge collapsed January 2022. PennDOT opened the road, uh, opened the bridge in um, January of this year. And then uh, Domi installed some of the bike facility changes earlier this year. And then the, um, the uh, Jersey Barrier Protected Bikeway was put in this fall. <laughs>